Good morning, everybody. This is Leslie Wyatt with SoftPro. Thank you so much for joining us again. Saved you a seat. Our week, our biweekly webinar series. We're on episode 21, believe it or not. And today we are very fortunate. We have two great speakers, which I'll introduce here in a minute, and they're going to talk about fighting fraud and counterfeit checks and reconciliation within SoftPro, which is obviously a hot topic and very important. So we bought in the big guns that know a lot more about it than me. Um, just want to kind of reiterate a few housekeeping items. One is please send your questions via the question box per usual. We'll go through them and ask as many as we can. As you, most of you know, we send a recap within a day or two of the webinar, which will include a link to the recording that you're welcome to watch or listen to or share with other people in your office. And it will also include any outstanding questions that we didn't get to. Sometimes we can't get to all of them or we need to look into them them and we will send out answers to them as well. So again, I just want to thank everyone for joining. Feel free to type your questions into the question box and we'll get to as many as possible. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce both our speakers. First up, we have Lisa Tyler. She's a senior vice president with Fidelity National Financial and also the national escort administrator. So a very big job of making sure we are staying in check. And then after Lisa, uh, we're going to have SoftPro's uh, very own Jenny Gold, who is Senior Trust Account Reconciler, and she knows a lot about what she's doing, and she's been doing it here at SoftPro for about 16 years. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Thank you so much for joining us, Lisa, and we look forward to your presentation. All right. Thank you, everyone. It's Lisa Tyler. I uh, appreciate you joining um, today's uh um, today's seminar, I want uh, to encourage you to ask questions if you need to, and um, I will answer them as we go along. We have a lot to cover in today's agenda. We're going to talk about examples of high-risk transactions. Um, I'm going to show you how to identify fraudulent checks that we're seeing um, being deposited into escrow. We'll talk about best practices for protecting um, your company. <laughs> um, and then I'll give you some recent claims that we have experienced at Fidelity. Um, and then Jenny will take over with the third party uh, uh, reconciliation process. So we've got a lot to talk about. I um, hope to squeeze it all into this next 60 minutes, but let's get, let's get started. So um, fake check scams are plaguing our uh, industry. They are, um, just rampant right now. And I think it's because, you know, we're, we are probably at our most vulnerable because we're so unbelievably, unbelievably busy. Um, the red flag warnings of these checks uh, that are being counterfeit checks that are being deposited into escrow is that it's always a cash purchase. The payment is made um, by official check or cashier's check, usually issued by um, HSBC bank. <laughs> the payment is for usually 30 grand or more than the purchase price. So these are vacant land sales. The sale prices are low. Um, and so the sale price is usually like 80,000. The check is cut for 110,000 and sent into escrow. No earnest money is ever deposited. The full amount of the purchase price plus 30 grand is deposited into escrow. They want a quick close, obviously, so that um, we refund the overage back to the buyer, and that's what they get out of the deal. Um, the, 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 the real telltale sign is that the property is purchased from an out-of-state or out-of-country purchaser who has never seen the property. It's sight unseen, vacant land, residential um, property. So those are all the red flag warnings. What happens is that weeks after the file has closed, we're notified we're notified that the um, official check or cashier's check is completely invalid. The payment is reversed and deducted from our trust account, leaving a shortage. So in the cases that I'm, or the examples I'm going to provide you, like they send us $110,000. We deposit the $110,000. We wait 10 days. We close the transaction and 30, 60, 90 days later, they come back and take the $110,000 out of our trust account. Um, based on the language in our banking agreements, the banks have the ability to reverse any deposit that's credited to the trust account um, if it's later found to be fraudulent. Who knew, right? Even 90 days later, this applies to even official checks and cashier's checks dispersed 
against after waiting the recommended time period. This is what our banking agreements say. Cleared checks and cashier's checks. Fraud warning. Please be aware that fraud often occurs in relation to counterfeit cashier's checks that are presented to you as legitimate. And the fraudulent party seeks to acquire the funds from you at the time the bank makes the funds available, but before the fraudulent check is returned unpaid. It's an unlimited amount of time. So even if you wait 10 days before you disperse against the funds, the bank still has the ability to to recall those, those money, that money, excuse me, even months after the closing already takes place. Um, and what is the most disturbing in these cases is that the buyer is always an imposter. In other words, they just make up an alias. And since it's an all cash, vacant land purchase, even if they fill out a statement of identity, we don't go and check it against anything unless there's a possible lien against that person. But since it's all cash, we don't even care. So these, it's impossible to rewind or undo the transaction after it's already closed because this person's long gone and we can't find them because they used an alias to conduct the transaction to begin with. So as a result of these continued fraud attempts and successful attempts um, in multiple, multiple states, um, at our company, the Fidelity family of companies, we only accept wire transfers on cash, cash purchases of vacant lots intended for residential building. Um, the, the rule for our company, it doesn't apply to large vacant land intended for commercial use or takedowns from a builder or developer. Obviously, those are excluded. But for just a single vacant lot purchase, absolutely, we require wire transfers. We don't accept personal checks any longer. We don't accept official checks. We don't accept cashier's checks or any other instrument other than a wire transfer. Um, if there's earnest money required in the contract, that has to be sent by wire transfer as well. And I totally get it. I get it. I realize, you know, as an industry, we've been plagued by wire fraud, right? It's my life. I live it all day, every day. Uh, trying to get wire transfers back for uh, home buyers that have just been duped into sending their entire life savings to some fraudster's account. But uh, we've been those targets for a long time, and, uh, and so have the buyers in our transactions. And we have uh, a way to make sure that buyers can send their funds to us safely. Um, we, ha we have a method for making sure that um, they can still wire transfer to us, and we, we have immediately available funds as a result. Um, and, and, and at the same time, then avoiding um, exposing our trust account uh, from being overdrawn by dispersing against, you know, a counterfeit check. We know how to prevent wire fraud. Um, and so we're using wires instead of checks because of the unbelievable amount of counterfeit checks that we're receiving as an industry, not just our company, but as an industry. In addition, um, our company at least is uh, prohibits the refund of more than $1,000 due, uh, due to overages. So the, one of the red flags that I shared with you earlier was the fact that the sale price is $80,000, but the buyer sends in $110,000. What the take is, is the difference, right? The $30,000, that's what they get. They don't want the property. I mean, the property is eventually going to go to tax sale because they're never going to pay property taxes. The 30000 is what they get on the take. And so now we're not allowing refunds of more than $1,000 to any buyer on a transaction that looks like the transactions that I've already described to you. Um, and, and, and in addition to that, any refund has to go directly back to the contract buyer. The other, the other telltale sign um, of the fraud is that they want the $30,000 to go to some third party entity, not the contract buyer, but an LLC um, or a corporation set up by the alias buyer um, uh, so that they have the ability to cash that check. So now the, at our company, we've established a, a protocol to protect ourselves from this fraud because we've 
fallen victim to it so many times that the refund can't be more than a thousand dollars and it has to has to has to go back to the contract buyer and no one else um regardless of whether a tran transaction comprises all of the red flags that i uh, have given you um we still have to have to even if it's a portion of those red flag warnings have to accept wire transfers only and notify the buyers up front at the opening of the order to allow them sufficient time to make arrangements um, to send that mon money by wire transfer on time. Only um, send wire instructions securely and in advance with your, you know, company, your company's policy. Obviously, we have a policy for how we get that information out and follow any and all procedures put in place to alert the buyers about wire fraud and how to protect themselves. Um, that's really the way to, to to protect buyers and protect our company from falling victim to the to the crime. Now, so far, our company has three claims. Uh, the first one uh, had a sale price of, of eighty thousand. The HSBC check came in for one hundred and ten thousand. It was for property, a vacant lot purchase in Merced, California. The buyer or the alias name was James Arlton. Uh, obviously, James Arlton made off through his LLC uh, with a 30,000, almost $30,000 profit that that property is just going to sit there until we get a judgment against him and then regain that property, um, ownership of that property and resell it in order to recoup our losses. It's also happened in Cleburne, Texas, where the sale price was $41,995. The buyer sent in 68,000. Robert Ferreria uh, made off with the difference. And then in Winslow, Arizona, the sale price was $112,888. The check amount came in for $150,000. Marin Jones made off with the difference. Now, this isn't just happening at the Fidelity family of companies. Every single underwriter has sent out um, has sent out uh, underwriting bulletins, making sure that their agents are aware of this scam and how to prevent it. Um, First American has fallen victim to, or and its agents have fallen victim to this crime uh, seven times in Silverthorne, Colorado, in Landers, California, in um, Grand Traverse County, Michigan, in Arizona City, Arizona, in Sarasota, Florida, in Merced, California, in New Bra uh, Braunos, uh, Kamal County. Texas. So it's happening to all of the um, all of our agents and our entire industry nationwide. Don't think that it's just the Fidelity family of companies. And it's not just HSBC. The latest flurry um, has all been HSBC checks, but we've also seen the crime perpetrated using checks from Fifth Third Bank and of course, Wells Fargo Bank and most recently, um, Chase Bank. I'm going to show you an example of the Chase Bank scam. Uh, this check represents the buyer's cash to close for a cash transaction that was um, supposed to close uh, a week early. The realtor uh, was only able to supply our office with an email address for the buyer. Remember, the buyer doesn't ever come see the property. It's sight unseen, which should be the first red flag warning. Now, you wouldn't think realtors would be so desperate in these times to take a sight unseen buyer, but that's the case. They sent a settlement, we sent a settlement statement and let the buyer know they needed to contact us for wire instructions. Uh, for the funds to be wired for closing. The buyer responded that a cashier's check had been sent. And as you can see, it's not a cashier's check, right? And it's not from our buyer. Our buyer in this transaction was, look at the bottom of the check, the memo says, who? Robert Ferreria. Does that name sound familiar? It should, right? Because we already have a claim involving an alias buyer of Robert Ferreria. Uh, but in this case, the check comes from Harlem Children's Zone, not the buyer of Robert Ferreria. And the purchase price of this particular property is $139,680. He said in, in his email, he sent an extra, he sent extra money to cover cost and just to return any overages to him. You get that's what their take is, right? They don't care about the property. They're not even in the United States. These, these people are from places like 
Nigeria and Russia, where it's legal to hack and legal to do um, uh, the activity that I'm talking about. They're not going to get arrested for it. The purchase contract in this transaction says he's from Boston. The company name on the check, which actually seems like a legit company, <laughs> is from New York. However, the address on the check doesn't match the address on their website. And it looks like the check was, well, from what I can tell, it's mailed from Atlanta. Um, and obviously, you recognize the buyer's name as Robert Ferreria. He used that same name before to buy the lot in Texas. The Robert Ferreria that we have information on, he doesn't exist. He's an imposter. None of the buyers in this scam are real persons. They're all fake names. Here's another example I want to share with you. Uh, this check was used for a cash sale of $75,000. The transaction was uh, a for sale by owner, which most of them are. There were no real estate agents involved. The property was free and clear. The sale closed on Monday, and the following Friday, the title company was notified the check was invalid. The forgery on this one is, in my opinion, it's pretty subtle. There are only, you know, two small discrepancies to identify um, the to identify them as uh, as discrepancies at all. The American Bakers Association, the ABA routing number, and um, the ABA number and the and the routing number do don't match. Do you see that on the on your screen? Do you see that it should be the zero two zero number for the routing number up at the top, but it's four twenty one. That would be the first indicator that the check is is counterfeit. So the ABA route the ABA number and the routing number don't match. The ABA number describes the number which is used by all the um, banks in the United States to identify what that institution is and what um, Federal Reserve they're using. This number is used to identify the name of the bank, its location, and the Federal Reserve it uses. The routing number, sometimes also referred to as the routing transit number, is the number in the Micker line of the check. The Micker line is a row of numbers, uh, obviously at the bottom, you know. Um, those characters identify the the bank that hosts the account the check is drawn on. The check indicates it's drawn on Fifth Third Bank in Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky. Lexington is located in the um, 08 Federal Reserve, not the 04 Federal Reserve, as it indicates at the top of the check. The first two numbers of the routing number indicate which of the 12 Federal Reserves the check was issued on. A map of the Federal Reserve um, can be found using that, all of the Federal Reserves nationwide, um, using the link provided on your um, screen. All three of these items need to match up in order to validate the check. Now, I know that when you're when you're processing a deposit, when you're when you're when you're receiving in funds, there is no freaking way you have time to identify all those little subtle items that would indicate the check is counterfeit. That's why I'm telling you, even though our industry is plagued with wire fraud, we still have to demand wire transfers instead of checks because even if you wait 10 days and disperse against this item, it still can be recalled by the issuing bank as a counterfeit item. Here's some other scams. <clears throat> um, in this particular scam, the sale price was $379,900. The buyer was purchasing the property for cash, again, no financing. Although the purchase agreement required an earnest money deposit of five grand, the buyer remitted this check for the full sale price. The check was a company check from the Raymond Corporation. You see that, right? It's issued from the Raymond Corporation. The, the Raymond Corporation is not the contract buyer. This is the third party deposit. The check was drawn off a national bank and uh, the New York Federal Reserve, but the transaction was in Oregon. It was the purchase, the property was located in Oregon. The closing was located in Oregon. The escrow assistant deposited the check and sent out the third party deposit instructions to um, the buyer's real estate agent to get signed by the Raymond Corporation. The buyer's response to the real estate agent and the escrow assistant was, thank you for your mail. Happy you had a good Easter. Before 
I got your mail. I already spoke with my investment managers, and they have advised that since the funds are interest accruing, it would be foolhardy to tie it down and leave it idle for weeks. So would um, take option one preferably. I have come to the conclusion that 325000 should be sent to the receiver's account. At the end of this message, there is an investment window for shipment of medical equipment, which I would be investing in with a return on investments in a couple of weeks when I will be cleared to travel. I will humbly um, still retain your services and we conclude this purchase uh, then. I once, again, appreciate your diligence and professional services provided me. Thank you and I await um, your urgent action on this subject. So what's going on, right? What's going on? The buyer's trying to cancel the transaction and get the money back um, before we have time to determine that the check is completely counterfeit. Luckily, we didn't fall for the crime in this particular circumstance, but you've got to know this is going on because your staff is moving lightning fast and they're exhausted, right? They have what I call COVID fatigue, COVID fatigue, and they're vulnerable, completely vulnerable to falling victim to this crime where that 379000 is going gonna, is gonna to bounce after we've already canceled and returned a portion of the funds back to the buyer. Um, online auction sites. Now, this scam has been going on for years, but I've got to tell you about it just because it doesn't stop. It goes on and on and on. <laughs> online auction sites like eBay or Craigslist. Craigslist is the most frequently used one. It benefits consumers and merchandise resellers by helping them find one another and creating a venue for an exchange of goods and services. The sites are also, you know, they also create an opportunity for fraud because um, there's no face-to-face -face interaction between the buyer and the seller. And the names of our companies, meaning like Alamo Title, Chicago Title Company, Fidelity National Title, have been used repeatedly by online auction buyers in an attempt to siphon funds from sellers. Currently, the, the companies that are under attack at the, at, in the Fidelity family are Alamo Title and Fidelity National Title. And um, the purchases, are they have nothing to do with real estate. Here, here's how the deal goes down. Uh, if you're not an online buyer, because I'm not an online buyer, I, I, I had to do a lot of research to figure out how this happens. Um, an online buyer is a successful bidder um, or purchaser of a high ticket item, typically sold at $1,000 or more. The buyer sends the payment via overnight delivery to whoever the seller is. The buyer uses um, someone else's account, usually one of our accounts, to ship the payment overnight um, using FedEx or UPS. Um, they use one of our account numbers. The check um, usually exceeds the, or always exceeds the amount of the purchase price. In this in instance, the item per, um, purchased was a brass cash register, like an antique item. It was from 1913, which sold for $1,000. The check arrived at the seller's residence in the amount of $2,000, $550. It looked legit, um, but why did it exceed the amount of the, per, uh, uh, you know, the merchant, merchandise? The merchandise was sold for $1,000 at auction. They sent $2,550. Um, the, the seller received this crazy ass rambling message from the purchaser about the difference. How are you doing today? And hope you're having a wonderful week. I'm sorry for the delay of the payment. I sent the payment to you overnight. Here's the overnight tracking number. The mover's fee has been added. Get that? That's the key right there. The mover's fee has been added to the payment sent to you. As I told you initially, that the mover's fee will be included in the payment. The overpayment is meant to cover the cost of shipment for the item alongside my other properties, including tax and insurance. Please, upon uh, cash of the check, deduct the money for the item purchased from you and make the rest fund available to the movers that'll come and pick up the item. 
Send the money via money transfer attracts little charges. So you are, are to, duct, uh, to deduct the money transfer charges from the money I sent you and send it uh, uh, to this Ricardo Wall, who has nothing to do with the transaction, but is apparently, quote, unquote, the mover. Ricardo Wall in Stanley, Wisconsin, kindly get back to me with the money transfer details. Um, and then uh, goes on to say where, you, you know, uh, how, how to respond. Um, it, it says, you know, the money transfer has to have a reference of an eight digit number and that the $30, $30 for sending the funds needs to be deducted from the 2,500. It goes on and on. Um, now, the check that, 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 that was received by the merchandise seller online um, was from Alamo Title Company. And out of curiosity, that seller decided to contact our office to see if the check was legit before he deposited it at the bank. After checking their S uh, our system, um, we confirmed that the check was counterfeit and the seller canceled the online transaction and relisted the item for sale. But honestly, it most of the time does not end up that way. Most of the time, the the person who's selling online goes ahead and deposits the item. Many times the online merchandise sellers, they deposit the check, cross their fingers and hope the check clears the bank. <laughs> Seriously. And uh, in all cases, the sellers, uh, you know, um, have not paid the shipping bill or release the merchandise prior to discovering the check is counterfeit. But the, but the real problem is, is that because our bank accounts all have positive pay feature, the check gets, the check gets um, returned as counterfeit. And then they get charged a $50 fee for, um, for depositing a counterfeit item. And so when they call our offices to say, Hey, 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 is this a legit check? We tell them straight up. If you if you deposit this item, you are going to be um, you are going to be charged a counterfeit deposit or processing item uh, fee from your bank. Um, and for some of our accounts, we get more than twenty five to thirty of these counterfeit checks. In other words, when an online uh, transaction occurs, it's not just one; it's usually twenty to thirty items, and they'll send out all the checks at once, and then we get bombarded with phone calls from the public wanting to know if those check, checks are legitimate or not. And in some cases, we've actually had to either institute not just positive pay, but payee positive pay. So normal positive pay matches the check number with the check amount, right? We've had to, in some cases where we've had more than 30 checks come through as counterfeit, we've had to actually turn on payee positive pay, where it not only matches check number, check amount, but also check payee name and won't um, and won't pay that item unless all three of the all three of those um, uh, match. And so we've had to do that. In some cases, we've had to just shut down our trust account, move the funds to a new account and start all over again, just because the volume is too much for us to bear or stand. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to mention before I wrap up here is that you need to be securing your outgoing mail and packages. I mean, the, the whole, um, the whole impetus for how the crime is perpetrated is the fact that the um, checks are stolen out of the mail. If one check is issued by your operation, it's stolen from the mail and is later duplicated and used to purchase merchandise um, or services on Craigslist, you have to make sure um, you know that you're that somebody's monitoring your positive pay constantly, especially on days. Um, like the day after Thanksgiving, where banks are still open and processing, but our offices are not open. So please make sure that your branch is securing their outgoing mail and packages before they're picked up by the carrier. Um, like I said, if it happens once, it's going to keep happening for at least 20 plus times. Um, let the callers know the checks are counterfeit. Tell them that if they attempt to cash them or deposit them, their bank's going to charge them a counterfeit check processing processing fee. And it, if the issue persists past 20 checks, then you need to either turn on payee positive pay or shut down the account and open a new one. And do 
please do recognize that not all banks offer payee positive pay. Only the larger financial institutions offer payee positive pay. Smaller banks that even we bank with don't offer that feature. Um, and then, uh, it, you know, if someone's uh, using your overnight account uh, or using your overnight delivery account number, make sure that your OAC knows to watch those bills to make sure they're lined up with legitimate um, transactions uh, so that you're not paying for overnight delivery fees for these fraudsters that are perpetrating the fraud using your overnight delivery account numbers. All right, so it looks like I'm all the way through my presentation and I didn't get any questions unless, Leslie, do you have any for me? I do, actually, yeah. Um, so someone just wanted to verify from your perspective, you know, what is the, the best way to uh, reduce this chance? And they're assuming that wire, and I know you talked a little bit about it, but just can you just confirm that with a wire, they kind of remove that um, instance where they might have this fraudulent check? Yeah, so these um, transactions that have happened at all of the title companies across the nation all have the same characteristics. Uh, it's vacant land, all cash, quick close, more money than you need to close. That should be like the first red flag. Who gets 110000 on an $80,000 purchase? That should be like the trigger. For us, we're just not accepting checks anymore for those types of transactions. If they send us a check, we just cancel. We're done. I mean, none of us are desperate for business in this day and age. We're dying because we're so overwhelmed with business. We can pick and choose who we want to close transactions for, who we want to insure transactions for. So be wise about it, right? Um, and 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 if if it feels like a legit transaction, then then they should be able to wire the funds rather than send a check. That sounds right. And um, the last one I would ask here is just, you know, if they suspect that um, or, you know, the person refuses to send a wire or for whatever reason they um, suspect that it is fraudulent, you know, where should they go, like, report this? And I know it varies from state to state, but just kind of like, you know, if you're just a if you're a title officer and you think that something is, is off, they should, you know, what is kind of the process that you think they should? You know what? I report sure them all. The right hand? I, I I'm so used to IC3.gov because of wire fraud. I report them all to IC3.gov. They assign uh, an FBI agent to the case, no matter how big or how, how small. And it's kind of the most efficient process because local law enforcement really doesn't want to get involved, they, especially because the check is coming from outside of their juris jurisdiction. They wouldn't, wouldn't be able to... To, to, to do anything about it. So I just report everything to IC3.gov. They can all, that makes sense, okay. Um, one other question here, someone says, you know, so do you only require wires for what you think might be fraudulent or is that just like common practice? No, I'm. I, we require wire transfers for um, transactions that fit the profile I gave you. They're cash purchases, the payments made by um, uh, official check or cashier's check. It's way more than the amount to close. It's a low sale price. No earnest money is called for. It's a quick close and the buyer's from out of state and they bought the property site unseen. That has to be a wire transfer or they can just go away forever. Yeah, yeah I mean, honestly, if it meets even some of those, you're you're going to um, obviously <laughs> want to raise a red flag. Uh, someone else, uh, this will be the last question. We'll turn it over to Jenny, but somebody else just uh, asked um, IC3.gov question mark. Could you just kind of touch, touch on that real quick so, so they know what they're what that is? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the uh, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network um, created a website probably six years ago, I think it's been. It's called IC, the number three, Dot gov g o v as in government and um, it's a quick way to report fraud um, and it goes out to multiple law enforcement um, uh, institutions like the FBI, Secret Service, IRS, Crimes Enforcement Unit, and local police department. And so when you send in a report, like a police report that you would file with your local police department, and hopefully you don't have that experience, but I've had it several times. Um, if, you, if you file with IC3.gov, they actually disseminate the report to the 
uh, to all of those law enforcement agencies so that whoever has availability to um, pick up the suspects or do an investigation can jump on it right away. So it's the most, it's the fastest way for us to report an incident and get action on it. It's um, available at ic3.gov consumer complaint. And we use it all the time. I probably report at least three to six times every day. Okay, great. That's really good information. I actually didn't realize you could just do it in that one spot. So thank you. Okay, I think with that, uh, we've touched on most of the questions and we're going to turn it over to Jenny Gold with Soft Pro to talk to you um, about how Soft Pro can help with prevention. All right. Hi, everybody. This is Jenny Gold and um, I've been with uh, Soft Pro in the Reconciliation Department for 16 plus years. So I've seen how the industry has changed over the years and really how big our department has has grown due to the point that a lot of Soft Pro users really, really benefit from third party reconciliation, which is my department. So um, I'm first going to show a few uh, basic terminologies, uh, basic lingo terms that I, this may be elementary to the majority of you, if not everyone, but um, I, these are terms that I'm going to be throwing out as I talk. So I just wanted to uh, touch on a few basics. So first of all, the three-way reconciliation, which um, uh, is the are the basic reports that we provide our customers because that ties the trial balance, book balance, to the bank statement to make sure that you're truly reconciled in your soft pro software. And I can jump ahead really quick and show. So these are kind of the summaries of what those three sections are. So we run an uh, reconciliation summary report, which shows the breakdown of those three different sections. And so the book, the trial balance lists all the files and ledgers that are posted in SoftPro that either have balances or overages or shortages through the particular month that you're running that report for. And that number needs to be the exact same number that's in your book balance report, which shows everything that had been posted in SoftPro for that particular time frame of that month. And then you match that to your ending bank balance, which you will pull up on your bank statement or on your online banking. Those three tie together on your reconciliation report. And that's what technically that is the, the true meaning of three-way three -way reconciliation. And so we as the third party reconciler, we make sure that all of our customers are three, three way reconciled um, when we run our monthly reports for our customers. We also have daily reconciliation, which I'll touch on in a minute, but I'll just go over these quick terms that I use. So posted is any transactions that are entered in your in SoftPro and cleared are the transactions we look at that have cleared the bank. So Posted is soft pro, cleared is bank. And um, and there's gonna and the exceptions items are the items that we look for on our daily or monthly reconciliations that could potentially in the long run be fraud or just are items that are showing on the banking side that are not matching what you originally had posted in soft pro. So I'll touch back on exception items a little later. And so uh, our basic service as a three-way third party reconciliation is the monthly. That's just when a lot of the smaller or um, clients that utilize our software, sometimes they just want to see what their accounts look like reconciled from the previous month. And so uh, you just go online, you pull the previous month's bank statement, and then you run these five basic reports in out of ProTrust in SoftPro. And like I said, you run your summer report then you run your trial balance, your book, your statement proofing register is basically, it's, it's our data version of what the bank statement is from that previous month. It breaks it all down by credits, debits, subtotals them, and then totals them. And so you basically, you run your statement proofing register in, in SoftPro, and if that doesn't match to what the online banking statement is, then you need to go back and, and figure out where you're off, You some maybe, a bank fee, a wire fee, a $30 bank fee is on the bank statement that wasn't posted into Soft Pro. That could throw off your statement proofing register, something as simple as that. Um, but if you're only doing monthly reconciliation and if you're looking for exceptions, it may be off. 
you may have to go line by line on your bank statement compared to your statement proofing register, let's say your, your debits are off, your disbursements are off. You may find a check that cleared the bank for a different amount than what you had posted in SoftPro, and that's what you need to research. Then and there, you need to pull up your, your, on, your image from your online banking, see if it was a bank error or if some, a check was manually. Sometimes um, property taxes are, are manually cleared on a check by the you know the client by the soft pro user it's initialed and it's okay for the bank to clear um but they did not go back and change that amount in soft pro so your statement proving register isn't reflecting the amount on the check that cleared the bank so that is an item that you would look for and itemize you know and, and make the adjustments so that your reports match your outstanding receipts and disbursements reports are any credits that did not match in that time frame at, on the bank statement to your statement proofing register. Maybe, maybe it's a deposit that was posted in SoftPro on January 31st, didn't clear the bank until February 1st. If you're running your January reconciliation reports in the month of February, because it's always the prior month when you're monthly reconciling, that's a legitimate outstanding receipt because that will be on the report because it did not clear the bank until the following month. And same with checks. You're always going to see checks listed on your outstanding receipts and disbursements, but it's always a good practice to go back and research why you have so many checks if they're really stale dated because they should be voided, they should be sheeted, they should, those are things that you just internally need to keep an eye on in your outstanding receipts and disbursements. So, at the end of this, if, if you have questions, I know I kind of flew through that. If you have questions, go ahead and send them in and I can answer more specific at the end. But I just kind of wanted to touch briefly on monthly reconciliation because that's kind of, that's the old school way. We are more in the reconciliation department as third party reconcilers seeing more and more software users coming to us requesting daily reconciliation. This for obvious reasons is the best practice to go because we are watching your report, your account yesterday versus last month. And there are so many pros in doing it this way because let's say a check, for example, cleared for a wrong amount and we catch it, we bring it to your attention because we're uploading your bank data, your online banking from, pre, from yesterday and we're downloading it, uploading it right into your ProTrust database and we're looking at reports and exception items are popping out to us that did not match your software to the penny that is at the bank. And so those are items we email in a report and send them to you every morning. And um, so a check, for example, it could be a bank error. They just may have miscoded it in it's scanned wrong. Sometimes a scan a check will scan, it'll it'll crinkle a little and the check number will get smudged. That would be an exception. If the bank's not reading the check number correctly, it'll come through on this report. And what we do as third party reconcilers, we go on your on we have access to your online banking, read only. We're only allowed to look at transactions. We go on your online banking, we look at the copy of the check, and we realize, oh yeah, it's matching to a check in SoftPro. It just smudged in the corner and it wasn't reading it correctly. That's a that's a standard scenario. Another scenario is the bank accidentally just cleared it for the wrong amount. We don't clear that for you. We bring it to your attention. And then usually you email us back and say, Oh, that's okay. We see, you know, we see where the 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 bank you know, cleared it wrong, but it did go through correctly. It's off by two numbers got transposed. Go ahead and clear it in our system. It's correct. That That's a, a rare case scenario. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen often. Sometimes our users of SoftPro will accidentally put the checks in upside down or the wrong way. So they clear the bank in opposite numbers. And so let's say 101, 102, 103, 104 in SoftPro, it's 104, 103, 102, 101, and we have bring that to their attention because all the, the checks amounts aren't matching up. They're flip-flopped in the system. That's something we bring to your attention. Um, and so so check related, those are kind of some of the simples. We we do catch fraudulent checks. Um, and we don't not like like Lisa was specifically saying hers were you know very specific to the to the routing number. We don't we don't pick up on that. We just what what flags us is a check is not balancing to the correct amount, 
or a check number is wrong, we view them. If we can't figure it out online what looks wrong and bring it to your attention, we instantly just put it back on you and say, you need to research this immediately. Let us know, you know, contact your bank if something doesn't look right. Um, and so that's where we come in for catching fraudulent checks. We just kind of, we're, we're the middleman that bring these things to your, bring these items to your attention on a daily basis just so that you don't, because uh, as Lisa said, you how busy you guys are, we're kind of here to, you know, to catch these things for you. And, um, and, uh, and on this slide, the last item I had written, by looking at your trial balance report, that shows your balances, your shortages, that is a really good report to constantly, technically it really should only be one page long because if once it gets two, three, four pages, it, it means that that the users of software aren't able to keep up on it and they've just got a whole bunch of files in there that were off. They're not balanced to zero and we can't do all of that as third party reconcilers, but we bring this report to your attention and say, please research this. This is still a pending check that should have been cut and that's why it's showing as a as a shortage or this file is off by 30 cents. I told you last month that a wire went out for 30 cents more at that got in from the lender that what you posted, you really need to figure out, do you need to collect that 30 cents? Do you need to send it out? This file should be zero. So that's what the escrow trial balance is. And that is what we are always reporting on. And the smaller it is, the less time it takes for the users to have to take time out of their day to research. And, and it's just, it's, it's a cleaner, more accurate account. And it also saves time because if it comes time to you being audited, they're going to tell you you need to clean this up and then right then and there you have to seriously drop everything and report it you know clean it up and do all that research then so as third party reconcilers we're always nudging you reminding you stay on top of this stay on top of this because it will come back to haunt you later um and so that's kind of that's kind of what this basic slide is just kind of talking about the basics of what daily reconciliation really really helps because it just it's you're keeping a, a clean eye on your account on a daily basis we're we're and we're here you know to help you and keep it as clean as possible and I realize all all users of our software are at different levels and using different versions of our software and um, some have high uh, you know volume some are smaller but um, it, it's just kind of a case by case scenario with all of our customers and we just uh you know we are here to help in any way and you know as big as the account is or as small as the account is and it's uh third party reconciliation we've also come across in very rare case scenarios that it's not just fraudulent outside activity that we've caught we have actually caught internal some people you know with theft. And so, especially if it's a bigger company and there's so many hands in the pod and so many people are doing different things in, in the accounting side of things, we're also kind of policing it. And it takes, it takes the, the third party reconciliation also takes the, the internal accounting out of the hand of the people internal. And so we're just a third party reporting this and saying you know we've got no stake in this we're just we're looking at your bank here and we're looking at your soft your you know your software here and we're telling you this isn't matching you need to tell us why and we need to find the solution to make it balance and so um i'm looking at my notes so basically oh and Lisa had touched on positive pay. We highly suggest maybe all of you are already using positive pay, but if you're not, it has just been a lifesaver even from a third party reconciler. When those checks are being bounced out the next day and I'm bringing them to the attention of my, my clients, I'm just like, you know, why didn't this match? Why did this get rejected? And, um, and so that really helps them stay. Positive pay has been great. And, um, some of our some clients say oh you know just we're just going to go ahead and reprocess it um can you just go ahead and just you know bal offset the the re the original check and the credit and as third party reconcilers from an accurate bookkeeping standpoint we're always encouraging users of our software it's probably best to let's say let's say a positive pay came through because the check was voided for a scenario we highly suggest unvoiding the check, 
posting the miscellaneous credit rejection and then reposting either if they're going to allow that check to go through or if they're going to go ahead and cut a new check. So the original debit shows, the offsetting credit, and then this, the third debit shows because we've had a lot of audits take place where in that particular month, those transactions don't, if, if it's just left alone in the software, the debt, the disbursements and credits subtotal on their bank statement doesn't match 100%. They offset each other in the system and the bottom line doesn't count that in because they do are offset in the long run. But the day that the original debit rejection, all those go through, we highly suggest accounting for all of those in your system so that they are accounted for in your subtotals on your bank statement because we do see that come back to haunt the users um, when they're being audited because they want that 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 figure those subtotals to match a hundred percent but not everybody has to and then and also you have a relationship with your underwriter and they understand if once it's explained to them they get it and it's okay but as reconcilers we just think it's it's best to keep the most accurate bookkeeping possible to show all the activity that's shown at the bank in your system and um we also i'm kind of bouncing around but another uh check item that catches our eye is an ach if we see it come through the bank as an ACH or an electronic check and I look in soft in your soft pro and look it up and see that it was cut as an actual check but it's I'm viewing it online as a completely looking it looks like an electronic check I always bring that back to my customers and I say you know this debited for the right amount but it's not matching your check and they and a lot of the time they're saying we have told our bank a thousand times we do not honor electric checks electronic checks they just keep going through and then they reject it and then the clients get charged with you know the 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 return fee and but um we just so that's another thing as third-party reconcilers we are always bringing to attention if it ever goes through as an ach as an electronic because those are highly majority of the customers don't allow their banks to set send them through like that and then they they go back to their bank and reject it um but uh some wiring issues i, I did touch on on the the checks but wiring issues or are sometimes the lender doesn't exactly pay 100% attention to the wiring instructions and they accidentally wires get wired into soft pro users accounts or wired out god forbid they go out but um if they come in then they need to go back and you know I bring it to their attention I say why did this you know $150,000 wire I'm not matching it up to anything and they say the clients come back and say oh that was wired into our account in error we're having we got it we had it returned today and so that's a common thing that we find um sometimes a, a, a deposited check soft pro users sometimes put it in their operating account in error and when I'm reviewing their outstanding reports and I'm like why is this thousand dollar earnest money deposit dated three weeks ago still not clearing your bank account the client will come back and say oh my gosh we put it in our our operating account in error transferring today and then it comes off their outstanding report so as third party we're just we're just really watching all of your your watch we're watching your bank account we're watching your outstanding items we're watching your your trial balance which is your files with balances and shortages on them and we're just really kind of playing that middleman of the person that sometimes you, you don't have in your office who has the time to just watch these things and so daily is really good because we are keeping on it the next day it's easier to work with your bank when we're bringing checks to your attention and you have to turn around and go to your bank the bank is much more likely and cooperative to work with you the next day versus going back to them and saying i saw this check clear for 20 dollars too much last month and that we just see the cooperation just takes longer and you don't get that check fixed immediately and so daily reconciliation helps with that um daily reconciliation helps with um just key you know it, it's fresher in your mind sometimes we all get really busy and if you're on a monthly reconciliation um schedule sometimes 
next the, the next month or said, oh, I have to go back in the file cabinet and pull, you know, our hard copies of that file because I don't remember what happened. I know the name sounds familiar, the buyer sounds familiar, but I can't remember. So they're like, I'll get back to you. So they get back to me in two or three days. They finally find the file and they have to remember. So monthly reconciliation is definitely better than nothing, but daily we have seen almost... I'd say 75% of my clients, if not more, are definitely daily reconciliation. So um, I don't know if the majority of you do your own reconciliation, but if you weren't even aware that SoftPro had a reconciliation department, you could always contact your sales rep um, and do some inquiry, you know, inquiry on it and the pricing of it and the, your options for it. Positive pay as well. If you aren't set up on positive pay, we also provide a positive pay service that your sales rep can help you with. And if you if you aren't in direct contact with your sales rep, you are always welcome to. Uh, after this, you can inquire about my email, and I can uh, I can hook you up with the appropriate person to to, to discuss this. But um, I kind of I I really think that's kind of reconciliation and in, in a um, in a nutshell. Oops, I went too far. Yeah, that was my only slide. So are there any questions? <laughs> I think the biggest question was just how to find out, like how to get the reconciliation service and you just answered that. So okay. just to reiterate, if you are interested or you have any questions, you can reach directly out to, um, to Jenny or you can reach out to myself or you can reach out to your sales rep, of course, as well. Um, I don't, uh, let's see, I think I just saw another one. No, okay. Um, I think that's all the questions. So Jenny, thank you so much. It's so informative and it's so important that everybody understands um, how they should be reconciling, even if it's not through our service, but using our Correct. software, of course, and making sure. Um, so with that, I want to thank Lisa and Jenny again for agreeing to help us out and talk to you guys today. We will be sending out a copy of, of the PowerPoint or the recording, I should say. Um, along with a follow-up email so that you guys can listen to it or share it with your coworkers. I did get a couple emails during this session asking if they could share it. And of course the answer is yes. We, we definitely want to do everything we can for anybody in our industry to help prevent fraud. Um, uh, we of course included recipes, which uh, we kind of just a fun thing we do. Um, and if you try them, I I get, I get emails every week about people who've tried them or they share recipes with me. Um, that's super fun. So I always look forward to that. But with that, I'm, we're going to end today. I want to thank Jenny and Lisa one more time. And we will chat with you guys in two weeks. Thanks so much.